Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Medical Legal Consequences of Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder in Civilian and Military Populations. The information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law since the expert's consent, i.e., a business relationship where she or he is hired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Dr. Burton will discuss history of our understanding of PTSD, difficulties with diagnosis of PTSD, types of PTSD, PTSD in employment, combat military PTSD, resolving PTSD, PTSD in civil litigation, difficulties in litigation, and is it PTSD? <clears throat> to give you a lot of little background about our presenter, Dr. Burton Singerman serves as the head of three successful academic departments of psychiatry and has trained hundreds of medical residents, medical students, and medical health care professionals. His clinical and research projects with the Defense of, Department of Defense and the Pentagon have led to new approaches for the treatment and prevention of post-traumatic stress disorder. He has consulted on numerous types of legal cases, including medical malpractice, personal injury, and disability litigation. Attendees who require passcodes, the word for today is military. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you're applying for CLE credit, you must log onto your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You're also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those working, watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with the link to the archived recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list at the widget at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today. And Dr. Singerman, the presentation is now turned over to you. Well, thank you very much, Rochelle. Uh, I was just talking to Rochelle before we started and they recently had a TESA w webinar on medical marijuana that apparently was very successful. And the only psychiatric disorder where you can prescribe medical marijuana, which is now being prescribed in Pennsylvania, where I am, is post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and it's, um, it's apparently quite effective for certain individuals, although I'm afraid uh, many other people come to you trying to say they have post-traumatic stress disorder and it isn't always accurate. Uh, if we take a look at uh, the first slide, PTSD defined, the most important things are this is really a, a, a diagnosis where you really are exposed to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. You usually have individuals who are directly experiencing the traumatic event or witnessing in person the event as it occurred to others. Those are the most common types of situations where you see this uh, diagnosis develop. Uh, and you have a history of PTSD, post-traumatic stress, that really spans centuries. Uh, if the first major written account was in the 6th century BC, and if you read it, uh, you could really meet the criteria for our present American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5. So although the naming of this illness has changed over the years, and we'll discuss that, uh, the symptoms of the illness are really the same over centuries. In World War I, you had two lines. You had the Germans, the English, the French. They were very close to each other. They were, had barbed wire, they were sending shells at each other, and so post-traumatic stress disorder, the identical symptoms, was then called shell shock. You develop shell shock from having so many shells flying over your head. In World War II, the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress was called combat fatigue. So again, the same symptoms, but a different name. In fact, they did research in World War II that I wish they would have used in Vietnam. They found out that if 40% of a unit uh, 
had been injured or killed, that the probability of the development of combat fatigue was extremely high in those remaining. And in fact, it was required that soldiers would go off for rest and relaxation, would be given a leave away from combat. So when you see movies like South Pacific that actually occurred, and it was the Department of Defense made soldiers get out of the, being on the front lines because you could only be there for a certain time period before you'd no longer be functional. Unhappily, in the Vietnam War, which is really where our, our understanding of this illness became most evident, uh, there was no no tendency, there was no need, uh, they felt, to send people for rest and relaxation. People could be on the combat front for a long time. Bullets could be coming from anywhere, and the rate of uh, severe uh, reactions in Vietnam uh, was quite high. Uh, you'd find combat soldiers post-Vietnam with hypervigilance, irritability, severe withdrawal, and there was a markedly increased suicide rate among returning combat veterans from Vietnam. Then you had the Korean War, and it wasn't until 1980. That was the first time in 1980 that the American Psychiatric Association came up with the criteria for the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. There was no such illness previously described or called post-traumatic stress disorder until 1980. And that might surprise many people. It's only been 37 years. But that's when we started with PTSD. It seems like such a common part of our society now. Uh, and the criteria then was called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 3 that developed those criteria. And truthfully, they've changed a little bit, but not markedly, to our present uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association 5, which came out uh, a little over three years ago. Now, if you go into the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, uh, there clearly has been a continuation of the kind of severe uh, post-traumatic stress that I saw in Vietnam veterans when I was just starting my career. Uh, and uh, the effect on those individuals is quite, quite severe. They never, if they don't get proper treatment and they have developed this, they'll never reach their potential. Uh, if you look at types of PTSD as, uh, as it's defined on this, next, on this slide, there's military PTSD, then you have childhood PTSD. People often don't talk about it, but people who are severely abused in childhood develop major changes in the way their, their uh, brain is developing and the circuits in their brain. Uh, there's a marked increase in suicide with people who were severe, severely abused as children, and they often have marked mood instability. Uh, and it is uh, a very difficult thing to treat. In fact, medication has no role in treating this. It's all uh, being treated by psychotherapy, according to Charles Nemiroff, who was the chairman at Emory and now in Florida, who has done some excellent work on this in this area. And one of the real concerns is these poor children who I've worked with who have been abused. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll discuss it. I, right now I'm working in uh, Appalachia, and I have seven-year-olds who are being molested by their parents. Uh, mainly the father, let's say, if it's a, a if it's a girl, but it can also be uh, the boys can be molested too, and they come in uh, to uh, a program that we had treating the most severely abused children in Appalachia, and they talk about at seven that they're no good and they want to die. Now they don't attempt to kill themselves at that age. But when you ask a 16-year-old who has tried suicide three or four times and was abused much like the seven-year-old, you ask that 16-year-old, do you think that it was Alice's fault, this little girl over here who's seven, that she was abused like that? And the 16-year-old will say, of course not. She's a little baby. Well, then you say, you were Alice when you were seven. 
what makes you think you're bad? Well, I know I'm bad, and that's why I have to kill myself. And there will be repeated attempts at trying to commit suicide, uh, often cutting oneself, other ways of, of uh, getting at yourself. Uh, so this is not an e easy area, and we often overlook it, uh, childhood PTSD. Obviously, multiple uh, cases uh, have occurred from physical trauma, whether in car accidents or uh, fights or other forms, uh, and that often is in civil litigation. And then sexual assault. The highest rate of post-traumatic stress disorder occurs after a violent sexual assault. How, all sexual assaults are violent, but if you really think you're going to die uh, and you can't do anything about it, that has the highest rate of development of post-traumatic stress, even higher than uh, combat soldiers. So that's n nothing to be taken lightly. Uh, if you want to take a look at uh, examples of military post-traumatic stress disorder, the first case, uh, and I, I've just changed some of the demographics, but these are all real cases. Uh, when I was a resident, in Baltimore, I met uh, a man who had been one of only three who had survived in Vietnam in his unit. Uh, and the three of them had come together and made a suicide pact. And they agreed that they would go to the Vietnam Memorial in Washington and they would each commit suicide to make a statement about that war and the level of pain that they were suffering from. The two other uh, members did commit suicide at the Vietnam Memorial. He was not able to shoot himself. He came back to Baltimore. We had him hospitalized. He was in uh, Hopkins Hospital for six months. And I remember as a resident Nothing could teach you about the power of post-traumatic stress more than watching this individual. His guilt was overwhelming that he hadn't committed suicide. His level of trauma was extreme. And at night, he would be crawling on the floor. And if you touched him, he was in Vietnam, and he would attack. Uh, he really thought he was in Vietnam. This is, it was the most uh, uh, incredible thing I had ever witnessed, and it took six months, and you couldn't get six months in the hospital today. Uh, and finally, he was able to, be, to go into some VA housing with specialized support, and after about a year, got involved in group therapy and started doing better. Uh, the second uh, person I want to mention uh, was uh, a veteran from Iraq who came to the Laurel Highlands of Pennsylvania. And this individual had had uh, uh, in combat the role of going in the back door of the huts to make sure there were no terrorists as the, as the rest of the army people went in the front door. And he would shoot at anybody who was a potential terrorist or was having, were, had a gun. And then he would come out the front door and he would look around in the front and at times used his weapon in the front as well. This man uh, went into a subway, shot up the uh, electrical circuits to the subway, smashed in the back door, he then went into the subway and killed the 17-year-old assistant manager. He wounded the manager, and then he went out the front door. He walked for about 12 minutes, and a man who had just retired was going to get his mail. And for whatever reason, he thought this man was a terrorist, and he shot and killed him. Now, the sister of this man, and this is a, a, a case that developed a lot of notoriety, that went around the country discussing the fact that her brother was not in control of what happened. And he, she actually asked me to be a consultant on this case. Uh, unhappily, I was the chairman of a department of psychiatry, and this was a very 
a difficult case with two people being killed, and they asked me not to get involved in the case. And uh, I could not uh, uh, become involved if your CEO asked you not to be. So I was not one of the expert witnesses. He was convicted uh, and was convicted of murder uh, and received a life term. Uh, the jury uh, really split as to whether he should get the death penalty or not. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, much like that uh, soldier from Vietnam who thought he was in Vietnam when he was crawling on the floor, that whatever happened, and earlier in the day there was nothing wrong with this man, nobody saw anything, but suddenly he thought he was back in Iraq and he acted exactly as he did in Iraq. I want to mention um, uh, a couple things I had the privilege of doing. Congressman Jack Murtha was the head of the House Armed Services Committee and was the congressman for my district, uh, where I was the chairman uh, of psychiatry. And I had the opportunity, one, of his creating the national model program called the Defense Veterans Brain Injury Center and locating it in our region, which was for soldiers who did not get better uh, from PTSD after at least a year of treatment in Walter Reed or Bethesda Naval Hospital or another military hospital. And we had a specialized program for that. And uh, I was the psychiatrist who saw the soldiers there, which was very powerful. He also brought to my health system uh, Department of Defense research grants. Uh, and I was the director of uh, research for these grants. And what they involved was a national model of how to help returning rural soldiers uh, who didn't really have the support of major cities uh, and a, a large VA uh, to create an educational program so that they could be better understood and they could acclimate better when they returned to their small areas in rural America. So what we did was educate the religious, business, educational leaders, family members, health and mental health members, and uh, veterans organizations about the issues of post-traumatic stress and how it presents, and the issues of agitation, explosiveness, uh, and especially in the family, often these individuals uh, their, their families would break up, they would beat up their wives, beat up their girlfriends, they, they would lose control. And uh, we try to warn people of the signs and symptoms and try to prevent these things from happening through education while we also worked with the soldier himself. So the Department of Defense uh, research grant, that one is still going on and has been very successful and trying to decrease what happened in uh, the Laurel Highlands to that man who shot people at the subway, to try to decrease those kinds of things from occurring. And then finally, my cousin, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Randall Falk, was the uh, liaison between the Pentagon and various national air forces. He was in the Air National Guard. And he went to the head of the National Guard at the Pentagon and told him about his desire to create a resiliency training program for pre-deployed soldiers to decrease the probability of their developing post-traumatic stress disorder. And he brought in somebody named Don Meichenbaum, who is a psychologist and was named one of the top 10 psychologists of the last century and is just brilliant. And since I happen to know him as my cousin, he asked me to be the civilian psychiatric consultant for the project. And we went and traveled internationally. Uh, I was the oldest member of the group. Everybody, uh, my cousin and the others, they were generals or uh, they were pastors in the uh, armed forces. Uh, they were taking hikes. I often hardly managed to keep up with them. I promise you I didn't keep up with them. They were much younger and in much better condition. Uh, but that started something where we looked originally at the National Guard. The National Guard and Reserve, these are civilians who were suddenly 
taken and sent to Afghanistan and Iraq. They were not trained for it. They were not in a fort. They had not uh, signed up to become a, a member of the Army, Navy, Marines. They had some training. But they had by far the highest rates of suicide on return from the war, the highest rates of PTSD and suicide. And so what we tried to do in the National Guard and Reserve is come up with a program that would have them understand what they were going to face before they were deployed. And that program as a template then became, uh, through Don Meichenbaum, uh, after my cousin died, he was up to be a general and unhappily he died uh, early uh, at a young age. Uh, but Dr. Donald Meichenbaum continued that with others and that template was used in the Marines, Army, and Navy. And basically what it involved is you had people pre-deployment go through experiences that looked identical to the kind of things they would have to encounter when they were in Iraq or, or Afghanistan. They fought wars in the deserts of Nevada. Hollywood was involved. They really felt they were in the middle of a war. People went with blood coming out of them. Medics were treating people. Uh, and uh, I think you'll get uh, something uh, tomorrow in an email that was uh, given a name instead of a resiliency training. Dr. Meichenbaum called it stress inoculation training. Training. He's a trauma expert. And uh, so stress inoculation training and I think we're going to send you uh, a linkage to a YouTube on stress inoculation training. And when you watch it, you'll be, it'll be very hard for you to believe that that was occurring in the United States in the desert and not in Iraq. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of the, the individuals uh, of many that I treated when I was at the Defense Veterans Brain Injury Center. These were the cases of the worst post-traumatic stress, sometimes also associated with traumatic brain injury. One was a, a, a soldier in Iraq who was the sentry for a base camp. And he, he was up there. He was reasonably green to the service, had recently gotten to Iraq. And there were two young boys walking to the base camp. And they yelled in Arabic for the boys to stop, and they did not stop. And they shot over their heads, warning them to stop, and they did not stop. And the sergeant looked at the corporal and said, Corporal, shoot those boys. These are boys who are somewhere eight or nine years of age. And the corporal looked at the sergeant and said, I'm not shooting any kids. And then the sergeant said, if you don't shoot them, I will, and you'll be court-martialed. And the corporal then shot the two children. Both of them had mobile devices on bombs that would be set off by a cell phone from a distance. And apparently they were told by someone, a religious figure, somebody else in the family, where to go, where they could cause the most damage to U.S. soldiers and do not stop for any reason. This young man came back. He had a perfect record before he went to Iraq. As, as you know, the military screen for people who should not be in combat. And so they have not had significant issues or uh, types of uh, uh, problems as a juvenile that would have gotten them into trouble. He came back. Every night he saw the two children he killed in his dreams and he couldn't sleep. Uh, he had nephews that they reminded him of. He started drinking, which is very common in post-traumatic stress disorder is comorbid substance abuse. He then uh, had a major fight with his girlfriend where he actually beat her up. He lost his job because he lost his emotional control at work, so he became unemployed. He then started using pain pills, and then he couldn't afford pain pills, so he started shooting 
uh, heroin, uh, which was cheaper and is cheaper. And for five years, he basically lived this life. Uh, clearly a high-functioning person. He went into a grocery store and he robbed them at gunpoint for money to buy his heroin. And he was apprehended. It became clear that he had significant psychiatric problems and he was hospitalized at my hospital. Um, and basically, he hadn't really slept a night's sleep. So he was given more sedatives than you could imagine and finally fell asleep. And for about eight days, he either slept or he ate, and that was it. And then he did improve. And we had a senior judge who agreed that, and it's very unusual, this is before veterans' courts, that he needed to get treatment before he was sentenced. And he allowed him to go back to Iowa to his farm where he was raised to, to work with the animals, to do farm work, and to spend two years as long as he was in intense treatment. And at the end of those two years, he was given, given a sentence, but much lighter than armed robbery would give you. There's another case I could tell you about of a man who was the first tank in a convoy in Afghanistan who had a young boy in the road that, of course, being a good American soldier, would not run over, and the boy exploded his... He didn't explode. He didn't know he had a bomb. It was exploded. Two members in his tank were killed, and uh, right after that, the tank convoy obviously came to a halt, and there was an ambush on either side, and on YouTube, uh, this soldier's wife brought me the YouTube that had been shown on TV as propaganda uh, uh, that actually showed the boy blowing himself up in the ambush. So th these are things that were uh, just very painful and very difficult to deal with in relation to the military. I could give you many other cases. Uh, this man uh, could only sleep in a closet. He could not sleep in a bed. And he's now in Texas, and he's still not functioning extremely well. Uh, I'm going to go to questions in a second. But first, I want to talk about brain changes with post-traumatic stress disorder. There is a hippocampus where a lot of our memory is stored. There's a marked decrease in the size of the hippocampus in post-traumatic stress. The prefrontal cortex is the area that's the new part of our brain. The hippocampus is the old part of our brain. The prefrontal cortex regulates emotional processing and our ability to work through bad experiences. There's a marked decrease activity in the prefrontal cortex in those suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And the third clear thing is the amygdala, which is the fight or flight center. That's the organ which gives off adrenaline. And in people with post-traumatic stress disorder, it doubles in size. If these individuals are treated properly, which is an extensive period of time, you'll find that the hippocampus regenerates new nerves, neurogenesis, grows back to its normal volume, memory returns, you get normal activity in the cortex, and the amygdala shrinks back to its normal activity. But when you hear a noise that soldiers were out there and it sounded something like a gun, and you see them immediately react faster than you can imagine somebody reacting, that's the adrenaline of post-traumatic stress going through a body fight or flight response that used to occur when you were a caveman, when you had a saber-toothed lion and either you ran or you fought it, either died or you lived. Same reaction, but for us, it often comes from what's going on in our mind and is not always a healthy reaction, that level of thing. So we treat these people with cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, eye movement, desensitization. is a new form of treatment which really tries to decrease the intensity of what they're talking about. And one of the main things is you have to form an alliance with the person. They have to learn to trust you. And as the therapist, you need not to be overwhelmed. 
I want to stop now for questions. And Thanks, hopefully Dr. We'll have a few. Yes. If all the attendees can enter in the passcode for today, which is military, and any questions that you have for Dr. Singerman. Our first question, is PTSD curable? Absolutely. Um, it is a very long process. Uh, you, medications do help, but in the long term, they have to be able to describe what they experienced, and you have to be able to do it in a very slow fashion. So whether it's military or civilian PTSD, it is curable, but it is a very difficult and long process to reach that level of success. Um, I've seen many people do markedly better who are suffering from severe PTSD. Next question. Can children and teachers experiencing school shootings have PTSD? Uh, those kids who just went through the school shooting in Parkland and are now at Tallahassee and are going to go to Washington, if they were in that area and they watched their fellow students being shot, it's much like being in combat, except you're only 14, 15, or 16. And the probability is that there's going to be a high rate of PTSD among both the students and the faculty uh, in those things. And if you look at some of the older mass shootings, that's what we have found. Um, uh, yes, they are, they are highly susceptible to developing post-traumatic stress. Next question. Is it term from World War II, shell shock, the same term as PTSD? Uh, it's identical. Symptoms are identical. The only thing different is what they called it. We just hadn't come up with a name and the criteria for it. But, you know, in World War I, shell shock... It was actually kind of pejorative, but you just couldn't, you weren't tough enough to take the shells. It had nothing to do with toughness. At a certain point, everybody breaks. And World War I was just horribly vicious with those two lines right next to each other, rarely any advances, just killing each other. There were, I think, three million soldiers killed in World War I. Um, it, it, so it was a horrible war. Combat fatigue in World War II, we started to learn a little bit more about it, and the fact that the military made them take leave and go to special, to go and rest uh, was uh, very important. But that certainly didn't stop uh, the development of what we today would call post-traumatic stress in World War II. And in fact, after Vietnam and Korea and the greater knowledge of post-traumatic stress, especially after the diagnosis came out, uh, there are many men in their 70s and 80s who fought in World War II and were never diagnosed and never lived up to their potential and suffered from the uh, symptoms of PTSD uh, and finally have gone to the VA at an advanced stage to get help. Next question. Are there objective tests such as the MMPI that can rule in or rule out PTSD? Yes. Um, not 100%, but the MMPI is a good one, uh, as are many other neuropsychological tests uh, that look at, uh, there, in the MMPI, there's an issue of validity. And people who are trying to falsify having PTSD will show a very invalid scale on the MMPI. And that's a strong uh, warning that somebody's, uh, and I'll talk about it, either they were coached, sometimes I'm uh, unhappy to say, uh, since I'm speaking to lawyers, sometimes by unethical lawyers, uh, and I'll tell you why that could occur, um, but sometimes they can look up the symptoms and uh, work out and try to act it out themselves. There's a certain thing you see in somebody with PTSD when you've had experience. When they talk about the experience, they are at a distance from you. And they are speaking very slowly. It's almost like watching a, a film in slow motion. And you can see every detail of what they're describing. That's very hard, very hard to just imitate if you don't truly have PTSD. 
so I've never seen anybody be able to create, give me that impression and do it with, uh, without actual PTSD. But I have seen many people try to fake PTSD, both in the military and in civilian life. And our last question for this section, do you believe therapy with animals helps people who are suffering from PTSD? I have a I have a uh, an individual I'm treating right now who uh it isn't uh, war related it's from severe childhood abuse and um I uh one of the first things uh we suggested and this therapist suggested was a therapy animal and that animal has meant the world to him uh and he trusts that animal and it's starting to allow him to trust people so yes, it can be very helpful. Thanks, Dr. Singer, that you can continue with the presentation. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk about civil litigation and PTSD, and obviously workers' compensation, personal liability, disability insurance, vehicular accidents, these are things you're all familiar with. And the issue in civil litigation is what is the duration of the symptoms, what is the timeline of the onset of symptoms, and one of the biggest issues when you're trying to prove PTSD in civil litigation is does the jury and the judge actually believe in such psychological injuries, these invisible injuries? You know, somehow as an expert you have to educate. Uh, and there are just a lot of people who feel such things are bogus. Uh, and that can be a very difficult thing when you're in front of a jury. Um, you're going to do various things when you evaluate individuals, record reviews, independent psychiatric exams, then you obviously have the depositions and live trial testimonies. Um, and if you look at... Uh, why there's been an increase, which there's been a significant increase in the last 10 years of civil litigation using PTSD uh, and trying to prove PTSD is what the person's suffering from their injury. Uh, one of the reasons is they have found that monetary compensation from a jury triples if you prove to that jury that the person is suffering from severe PTSD and the effects of that and the potential long-term nature of it. So the monetary rewards definitely go up, and this is one of the reasons that uh, civilian litigation has moved toward uh, trying to prove PTSD in the litigant. I want to talk about the challenges of PTSD. Uh, I already told you about the effect on the family. Resiliency is being able to move forward uh, with one's life after getting successful treatment. The suicide rates are markedly increased in PTSD. You know unresolved PTSD, you can see it. You see a person in the back of a restaurant looking. They have to have everybody in view. I remember this in some of the Vietnam vets because you never knew in Vietnam when somebody was going to come in with a bomb and they'd have to look or a machine gun. And they'd have to be at the very back of the restaurant. And sometimes you could see these people. But success can occur in treatment. It's just a long time. And I want to talk about a few cases in civil litigation uh, that I've had. Um, one was, uh, uh, I'm going to go with the second one first. Uh, when I was doing child psychiatry, I saw an 11-year-old girl and 9-year-old boy in Baltimore. And this boy was forced to stand in the uh, uh, in the uh, restroom uh, for hours on end for basically no infraction. Uh, the mother had been beaten badly by her father, and she took it out on this boy. And she was obviously, to me, when I met her, extremely ill. I called CYS. I could not get them to take the children away from this woman. Uh, eventually, the woman cut off her lower leg. At that time, CYS intervened. 
and the children were then put into a foster home by the Chesapeake Bay. And I remember right after I finished my child psychiatry visiting them, and it was a different world from what they had gone through. But I also realized I had worked with them a long time, and I was probably the person that they felt most comfortable around at that time. Uh, it was it was a very powerful thing to watch. Uh, in Buffalo, uh, there was an abused woman who had severe PTSD. She also PTSD under a lot of stress. You can become actually psychotic, i.e., lose touch with reality. And she started having auditory hallucinations. She felt that. The children were devils. That's what the voices were telling her. She had two children. She took a knife and she killed both of them with a knife. Uh, it clearly came out of her post-traumatic stress disorder, which went un when under stress went into an actual psychosis. There was a Cincinnati stockbroker uh, who was a white-collar criminal and got put into prison. He was threatened when he was in prison by one of the gangs. Uh, he got extremely frightened. He had never been in any kind of environment like this. He asked for help repeatedly. He called. This went on for two to three months that he was asking for help. He was severely depressed. Never had an evaluation in the prison uh, in this rural state. He then committed suicide, and uh, the uh, county was successfully um, uh, found guilty in this case uh, because there was so much evidence that this man had asked for help and he was not given it. Another patient was uh, a patient in a large hospital in Iowa. He was severely ill. He was a Medicaid-funded patient. At the end of about nine days, you could see by what the uh, psychiatrist wrote, he no longer is actively homicidal or imminently suicidal, and he can be released. And basically, that psychiatrist was covering himself, because I know at that hospital, private patients who are paying out of pocket can be there for months. And this uh, young boy went to a community mental health center. They treated him two times. They really didn't realize, nor was the hospital uh, open about how severely ill he was. He ended up going uh, with his father to another community where he uh, smashed a man for no apparent reason and severely injured him for life. And uh, that was a lawsuit uh, that was very difficult. And one of the real interesting things the state had a desire not to say that psychiatrists could be uh, put into trouble or hospitals put into trouble if they discharged patients because they felt it would have a negative effect on the mental health system. And so the hospital was felt not to be able to be sued, and they sued only the community mental health center. Um, and lost, because really the Community Mental Health Center had done nothing wrong. And then the last case I want to mention to you is somebody named Rocco Vincenti uh, from St. Louis, who was an abused man by his father. He was very smart. He got an advanced degree. He worked with a psychiatrist I knew. Uh, and three years after he had finished treatment and had uh, left the city, this psychiatrist started getting notes from all over the country with uh, major death threats. And I know because I was working with my colleague who was experiencing this and the fear he had uh, both for himself and his family. And finally, this man came into the hospital with a gun and a nurse saw him. And we were finally able to identify who it was. The police went out to his apartment uh, they found a stash of guns, uh, and there was no doubt in my mind uh, that he had become paranoid uh, 
the, the psychiatrist had become a father figure of hate. Once he left, he became paranoid about the psychiatrist and three years later was planning to kill him and would have if the police hadn't intervened. And the court case in that uh, example was one where this man got committed uh, to the St. Louis State Hospital. So, uh, you know, these are these are very difficult cases, uh, and uh, they draw up a, a lot of uh, emotion in me, uh, and as they do in many other people. What are some of the difficulties in litigation? Well, you you get uh, uh, a post-traumatic case, civil case, and you have two psychiatrists with opposite opinions. I think it was the Aiki case where it went to the Supreme Court and they said you had to have a, a person who was accused of something and the question of insanity, they need to have a psychiatric expert witness, but then you have to have a psychiatric expert witness for the other side. And, and this really creates an issue where the credibility of psychiatrists, if you have two excellent expert witnesses and they have a different view of the same issue, uh, that can discredit the expert. And one of the things that I've experienced was lawyers trying to discredit me. I don't know, impeach, or I, I don't know what the right term for it is, but I, I remember being in a courtroom uh, where I was uh, basically in defense of somebody who uh, had been sued, and the lawyer started screaming at me and started repeating questions that he had asked me in the morning, and it was the afternoon. And I eventually said, I don't know if something's wrong with your memory, but I know I've answered those questions. And then I said, but if you continue doing this, I'm leaving this chair and I will stop testifying. And the judge uh, went over, uh, uh, called to me and said, uh, Doctor, don't you think I have something to say about your getting off that chair? And, can, and deciding that you're not going to testify any further? I said, Judge, you're absolutely right, you do. But you also have something to do with this lawyer screaming at me like this. It's not appropriate. And the judge told the lawyer to take it easy, and that stopped. So I, I know he was trying to discredit me, uh, and uh, I'm uh, appreciative of the judge's intervention. Uh, so we've already talked about coaching people to have PTSD or people trying to prove they have PTSD. At the very end today, I want to go through the actual criteria for PTSD so you really can see what the DSM-5 says. The first is PTSD A criteria. It has to be life-threatening. This has to be significant. You're not talking about a minor issue here. Uh, that occurs in acute stress disorder also, where it has to be life-threatening. But acute stress disorder is anywhere from one day to up to one month. As soon as the symptoms of PTSD last for more than a month, it no longer is an acute stress disorder, it becomes a post-traumatic stress disorder. So you have a time frame that has to last for a month. Then you go, uh, we're not going to look at adjustment disorder. It's not really that relevant. Uh, criterion A of PTSD, exposed to death, threatened death, serious injury, threatened sexual violence, direct exposure, or you witness this in person. These are the major uh, things that you see in cases. And criterion B. Criterion B is you have recurrent intrusive recollections, traumatic nightmares, much like I told you about the soldier in Iraq who could not sleep because he constantly saw those two young boys he shot. You can have a dissociative reaction where you do not know how you ended up and what happened in the last eight hours. And you end up in a place and you have no idea how you got there. Uh, then anything that reminds you of the traumatic experience, you have that automatic fight-or-flight adrenaline response. So mark physiological reaction, fight-or-flight. And then criterion C, you have, as you would imagine, 
persistent avoidance of any stimuli that's associated with the traumatic event. You avoid it, you try to keep away from the memories and any reminder, external reminder of those memories. It is not pleasant, it is very painful to go through and experience, and this is why people don't talk about it. They're afraid to talk about it because they'd be overwhelmed. And that's what takes a long time in therapy, is getting the person to trust you and making sure that you're not pushing them to talk about something before they're ready for it and before you've taught them various relaxation techniques, gotten them on the right medication, and do it very, very slowly. Because if you go too fast, you're going to have a person who will end up being in the hospital. Then criterion D, uh, this persistent negative belief and expectations about oneself. I am bad. The world is dangerous. That is not unusual. You blame oneself. The Number three, distorted blame, that you've caused the traumatic event. Somehow you caused it. It's not accurate, but that's how people feel. You markedly withdraw from interaction and social activities. There's this numbing in this withdrawal, often with a significant depression and a feeling of detachment from other people. And obviously you can't experience happiness. You, you feel in shock numb, you're walking through your life, but you're not living your life. And then you get criterion E. And this is, you need one of these two. Irritable, aggressive behavior, much like I talked about, the individual who beat up his girlfriend. Self-destructive or reckless behavior. You can well imagine that when these people uh, are employed, a coworker, the boss, they can lose control they rapidly become unemployed. And that's why a much higher percentage of the homeless are veterans than a percentage of veterans in the population because they have not been treated successfully and uh, they've turned to substances very often to try to treat themselves, much like the soldier from Iraq did. And the final criteria, and this is very important, must be more, for more than one month but this, the, what says G here, there must be significant distress but functional impairment. I've had people who undoubtedly had an acute stress disorder, students and others, but they have moved forward with their life and they have done very well, gone to college, even though they had a significant event uh, where they actually watched, uh, let's say, a, a bus accident, and they, they saw uh, the driver get killed and others injured, uh, and they were clearly tra traumatized. But they were able to move on after a period of time. And one of the questions in research, why are traumatized people able at times, certain types of people, to be able to move on and others not be able to move on it has nothing to do with toughness. Uh, there are vulnerabilities. If you've had abuse in your life, if you've had adverse events in childhood, you have a higher risk of PTSD. But anybody is susceptible to PTSD, much like the experiments in sensory deprivation uh, that the military does. Some people get into a sensory de deprived uh, uh, setting where they start hallucinating a day after they are put into that environment. Other people, it takes four days, but there's no person that will not start hallucinating if they're completely sensory deprived. The question is how long it'll take, and people have different lengths of time, but it has, again, we're trying to understand what it's related to. We are not sure. So you need to have functional impairment. And that often is a way that I can say this person is not suffering from ongoing post-traumatic stress disorder. The other thing is that makes it very difficult is substances. Because so many of these individuals are so agitated, they've got adrenaline flowing through them. They ha are feeling intense pain. Their suicide rates are up. 
They drink, they shoot, they'll take pain pills, they'll take anything to get any relief. And it sometimes is very difficult and takes a long time to keep them away from substances before you can sh be certain of what you're dealing with. And that is a major complication. And now, um, I'd really appreciate uh, more questions. Thanks, Dr. Singer. If anybody could possibly have understood anything I had said. If all the attendees can enter in the passcode for today, which is military, and any questions that you have for Dr. Singerman. Also, if we're unable to get to those questions, we'll be sending those over to him to uh, contact you to answer them. Our first question is, how much time after traumatic event does PTSD behavior begin? Uh, it can become immediate, but truthfully, there are, there are people who have delayed post-traumatic stress disorder. They go through a very traumatic event. They watch a buddy uh, in combat be killed. Uh, they are in a severe vehicle accident and uh, the other driver is killed, and, uh, and they've been injured. But somehow, uh, they're looking to rehabilitate themselves, and they're moving forward. And I'm not sure I understand it, but up to six months out, somebody who was not showing any symptoms of post-traumatic stress, I have seen people suddenly develop the whole syndrome. What caused it, uh, I have never been certain of. So it can come any time from right after the event to I've never seen anybody more than six months out suddenly develop the entire syndrome. And I don't have an explanation. Next question. Can the changes in the brain be seen on 3T MRI? Well, you, you could see these changes on PET scan. And you could see some changes on a 3D MRI. But why don't we, well, it's the same in depression. You have these kind of certain changes, but we never uh, do those tests, multiple thousand dollar tests, because you find that when uh, the depression lifts, the hypothalamus grows back to normal size. In PTSD, if the symptoms improve, 100% uh, you have the hippocampus regenerate and you have normal activity in the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala shrinks back to normal. So if there are active symptoms, you know that those abnormalities will exist. It's a, basically one-to-one, 100%. One, so uh, the symptoms, the experiences, are how you make the diagnosis. You usually don't use uh, really very expensive diagnostic testing, often that you would never get approved. Next question, what can we tell the court with respect to civilian PTSD recovery with regard to returning to work? It's, it's variable. Um, I had a, a, a woman who became a nurse uh, later in life who was accosted by a patient who had, had been withdrawing from drugs. Uh, and she wasn't physically harmed to a severe degree. I mean, there was some. But the fear that she experienced was in, immense. And she didn't, she continued in her uh, duties. When she went to her car, she couldn't drive. And she was just overcome by anxiety. I was asked to evaluate her as to whether she could return to some form of work at that hospital. She was a very honest person, like many of us, uh, most doctors and lawyers. She had obsessive compulsive traits. If we don't have some, we're not going to get through uh, the kind of schooling we got through. And she could not get the memory of that attack out of her mind and had a clear decrement in her functioning. And I told uh, I told the health system uh, that she would never return to work. Uh, that, in fact, I told the lawyer the only possibility would be this kind of treatment 
that would be extended for an ex a long time, and I can't be certain. And um, that would have made the health system responsible for all treatment that you got in the future. And so that became an issue uh, because I think the likelihood was low that she would be fully functional again. Some people, it depends on who you are um, and, and uh, you know, what kind of character you have. Sometimes the, the people with the highest character have the most difficulty resuming life after a horrible trauma. Thank you, Dr. Singerman. That was our last question for today. As, um, and I will be sending all your unanswered questions over to Dr. Singerman today. Please remember that if you're applying for CLE credit, that you must attend for the full 60 minutes of the presentation. You're also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. In addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for the past 60 years, CASA also offers free interactive webinars, expert written articles, research reports from expert witnesses, including the Challenge History Report 2.0 and Export Profile 360. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending, and most especially Dr. Burton Singerman for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Dr. Singerman or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding an expert witness for a case you are working on, please contact TASA at 1-800-523-2319. One of my colleagues will be following up with you regarding your feedback on today's presentation. Thank you all for attending. This concludes our program for today. And thank you all.